Natural Theology in David Hollatz by Yaroslav Pelikan Jr. Christianity is a religion of supernatural revelation. To this, give all the prophets witness. It is an assertion of the fact that the true meaning of God lies beyond the ken of the unaided human mind. Indeed, the Christian faith is so bold as to assert that he that loveth not, and only a Christian is capable of agape, true love, knoweth not God, for God is love. 1 John 4, 8. As a result, it may seem incongruous for Christian thinkers, dealing as they do with supernatural revelation, to concern themselves with natural reason. And yet, that is what they have always done. In fact, the past century in the history of Protestant theology has seen a heightening of the concern with natural theology. Ever since Immanuel Kant proved to his own satisfaction and to that of many others that, quote, all attempts to establish a theology by the aid of speculation alone are fruitless, that the principles of reason as applied to nature do not conduct to any theological truths, and consequently, that a rational theology can have no existence, end quote. Christian theologians and semi-Christian philosophers have debated the possibility of natural or rational theology. An attempt by Emil Brunner of Zurich to settle that debate has recently been translated into English and published in America. In this latest stage on the controversy with Karl Barth on natural theology and natural law, Brunner's book seeks to present a Christian view of the relation between revelation and reason. The reversal of the traditional order is significant, and arriving at transcendent truth. And while his attempt is certainly subject to serious qualifications, which would be the subject of a review, but lie beyond the scope of this essay, Brunner does show that the question is by no means an academic one. To become aware of its relevance, one need but remind himself of the fact that it has engaged the attention not only of the Reformed theologians Barth and Brunner, but of Blaise Pascal, the quasi-Catholic philosopher, of Christian Ernst Luthart, the celebrated Lutheran theologian of the 19th century, of Charles Hartshorn, a prominent American disciple of Alfred North Whitehead, and of the thoroughly unclassifiable Soren Kierkegaard, to name only a few. In addressing himself to the question of natural theology, David Friedrich Hollatz was in a tradition of almost two centuries of Lutheran dogmatic history. His Examen Theologiae Acroamaticae, which first appeared in 1707, has been called the last of the greatest textbooks of Lutheran orthodoxy. A comparison of the dates of his life, 1648 to 1713, with those of Philip Jakob Spener, 1635 to 1705, show Hollat's unique position in the history of Lutheran systematic theology. His place in that history may be indicated by the ratio, Hollat's examen to Kalov's Systema, to Bengel's Nomen to Kalov's Biblia Illustrata. And although the significance of natural theology for the beginnings and the fruition of Lutheran dogmatics has been ably presented by the 26-year-old Trolch, a thorough treatment of its place in the whole development, and especially in the period from Gerhard to Pietism, has not yet appeared. Such a study would perhaps be useful for an understanding of Kant, as well as of Pietism and of our own Lutheran forebears. 1. What right has a biblical theologian to discuss the problematics of lateral theology? This question, to which Trolch makes passing reference on pages 28 to 35 of his aforementioned monograph, without coming to grips with it anywhere directly, is the first claim to our attention. One of the moments in Hallatt's theology which seems to have influenced his answer to this question is his view of the perspicuity of scripture. Revelation in the stricter sense means, quote, a manifestation of matters which are secret and which are hidden under a sort of veil. For by the force of the origin of the word to reveal, apocalyptain, is to uncover and manifest things which are secret and which are hidden under a sort of veil, end quote. On the basis of 1 Corinthians 4.6, Hebrews 1.1, 1, 1, and similar passages, he concludes that, quote, After the completion of the canon of Scripture, there is no new and immediate revelation, end quote. That the Bible is, quote, a suitable and adequate principle of saving knowledge, also for the present state of the church, end quote. This conception of revelation, which bears verbal affinity to Luther's controversy with the enthusiasts, had nevertheless undergone considerable revision by Hallatt's day, principally through the controversy with Rothman. Thus, the clarity of scriptural doctrine necessary for salvation, defended by Luther against Erasmus in 1525, was now formulated in the words, quote, Scripture is said to be clear not with respect to things, but with respect to words, 
for unseen things can be expressed in clear and perspicuous words. End quote. If scripture is completely clear, and if this is a clarity with respect to words, could not anyone at all, Christian or not, determine the meaning of the Bible by a simple historical interpretation? This question was bothering Lutheran theologians in Hollett's time. For him, a theologian, in the broader sense, was, quote, one who properly, rite, performs the task of a theologian, explaining, confirming, and defending theological truths, even though he lacks a sincere holiness of will, end quote. Whether he had never been a Christian or had fallen away. Consequently, quote, a tractable, unregenerate man, prepared by the illuminating grace of the Holy Spirit, can attain to an external and literal knowledge of sacred scripture, end quote, though he might never be converted. For to the perspicuity of scripture must be added its efficacy. On the one hand, then, Hallett's dealt with the problems of a non-Christian's use of the Christian writings. We gain further insight when we observe how he dealt with the problem of a Christian's use of non-Christian writings. This had shaped the views of natural theology during most of the Orthodox period, and was receiving much attention at the beginning of the 18th century. Reason, unaided, cannot attain to the knowledge of the gospel. But there is a distinction, quote, between reason left to itself and reason illumined by the light of the divine word. The mysteries of the faith exceed the grasp of reason left to itself. Illumined reason, however, receives them as instrument and subject, though it is not the judge or norm of the articles of faith, end quote. Paul's use of logic in 1 Corinthians 15, 13 forward shows that, quote, logical process does not produce fides humana, which is uncertain and inconstant, but a firm and certain assent, end quote. This set of facts makes it permissible for the Christian theologian to employ both the, quote, organic principles which have to do with the instrumental disciplines, grammar, rhetoric, and logic, end quote, and the, quote, philosophical principles, end quote. Indeed, quote, without the use of reason, we can neither perceive, confirm, nor defend theological dogmas against the attacks of the opponents, end quote. He does admit, however, that it is not necessary, quote, always and everywhere, to turn a theological demonstration into a categorically and fully expressed syllogism, end quote. For this form of expression, if used too much, tends to become, quote, almost tedious, end quote. Two. Hallettes could justify his interest in natural theology from, quote, theology of the unregenerate, end quote, as well as from the formal or organic use of the principles laid down by pagan philosophers. Did not the depravity of man forbid his having any knowledge of God? The problematics of this issue had forced Flacius into the denial of the notitia dei anata. This does not seem to have bothered Hollitz at all. His reference to Flacius refute his errors on the image of God, treating him quite sympathetically. But there is apparently no mention of Flacius' denial of natural knowledge. For Hollitz, there was no conflict between the depravity of man and the natural knowledge of God, first of all, it seems, because of his view of the fall. Quote, Durch Adams Fall ist ganz verderbt menschlich Natur und Wesen. End quote. These words of the great Lazarus Spengler were known to Hollatz. But the latter worked out his view of the fall in greater detail. For example, he felt that, quote, Eve sinned first, being not more simple of intellect, but more inclined with respect to will. End quote. And again that, quote, it is false to say that Adam was not deceived by Eve's persuasion, but blinded by her love. End quote. To this view of the fall must be added his view of its effect, namely that, quote, the remnants of the divine image are natural. End quote. A statement that he proves by elaborate demonstration. If there are remnants of the intellectual or rational sphere of life, even the sinner must be a rational creature, since, quote, only a rational creature can receive the divine law. End quote. Hallatz points out that the divine image did not consist chiefly in dominion over the creatures, and that it was, quote, not to brutes, but to men who used their sound reason that God revealed the wisdom of eternal salvation in his word, end quote. Man's body, quote, in itself seemed a brute thing hardly capable of sin, end quote, while, quote, the beasts unreceptive to either divine law or holiness are expertes of sin, end quote. Because original sin, quote, formally consists in the lack of the original righteousness, which should be in a man, end quote, there are certain, quote, insights which are today innate in the minds of men. These are remnants of the lost divine image, testifying of the pristine wisdom, much as ruins testify of a splendid collapsed house, 
end quote. These are the articuli mixti, quote, the parts of Christian doctrine about those divine things which are partly known from the light of nature, as well as being believed from the supernatural light of divine revelation, end quote. And this in spite of the fact that 1 Corinthians 2.14 means, quote, by original sin, darkness was put over the human intellect, so that unless it is divinely illumined, it can neither comprehend purely spiritual matters, nor correctly transmit them to the will, which is in itself a blind potentia, end quote. Most prominent among these articuli mixti is the existence of God. As Luther said, God's quad est and quid est. On the basis of Roman 119, Luther emphasized that man can know quad est Deus, but not quid est Deus. Refuting the theory that, quote, nihil est in intellectu queen prius ferit in sensu, end quote, Hollitz maintained that, quote, after the fall there have remained remnants of the divine image, which are not dependent upon the senses, end quote. This is part of Hollett's long treatment of the natural knowledge of God, in which he maintains a position almost identical with that of Gerhard, except for his refutation of the inner light. His view is well summarized thus, quote, The natural knowledge of God is that by which a man partially recognizes the existence, essence, attributes, and actions of God from principles known by nature. It is divided into the innate and the acquired. The innate natural knowledge of God is the perfection with which a man is born, similar to abitus. With its assistance, the human intellect understands the truth of evident propositions about God without pondering them, having grasped their results and grants them undoubting assent. The acquired natural knowledge of God is that which is gained through pondering, on the basis of the testimony of others, as well as of an observation of creation. End quote. We have seen that Hallett found a place for philosophy in his system. It was, quote, a sort of culture for the soul, liberating it from its inborn boorishness and preparing it to grasp subtler matters and to defend true doctrines against the attacks of the adversaries. End quote. Therefore, the Trinity can neither be proved nor disproved by reason, though, quote, without reason, as the receiving subject and comprehending organ, we cannot understand the mystery of the Trinity. End quote. The adversaries attack the doctrine of the Trinity with the philosophical axiom, quote, quot sunt personae, tot sunt essentiae, end quote. But what they fail to see is that, quote, philosophy neither opposes nor contradicts revealed theology, end quote, since, quote, philosophy is the science of truth, and as the true does not contradict the true, so philosophical truth does not oppose the theological, end quote. All that philosophy teaches is that, quote, Quat sut personae finite, tot sut essentiae. End quote. Italics, my own. But why then are there atheists in the world? The heathen who did not know God in Christ were, in a sense, atheists, quote, not speculatively, but practically, end quote. Where, interestingly enough, he refers to the, quote, Brasiliani in Novo Orbe, end quote. For the natural knowledge of God cannot be eradicated. Anyone who would deny the existence of God would do so because he does not want to believe that, quote, there exists a God who is the omnipresent, omniscient, and most just punisher of trespasses, end quote. On the basis of John 5.23, 1 John 2.23, and the Athanasian Creed, Halatz concludes that, quote, he who does not honor the triune God is an atheist, end quote. It is one thing to know that God exists, quite another that he exists for me. And though Hallett did not know the distinction in terminology between the ontological and the existential knowledge of God, he did recognize that the unregenerate, quote, cannot understand the way a sinner is reconciled with a God offended by sin from the principles of reason, end quote. Nevertheless, quote, God willed that after the fall, there should exist in the human intellect some common and practical concepts, so that all men might from them acknowledge, worship, and praise God for his benefactions to all creatures, end quote. Suffice it to say that to other men like Tennyson in Canto 56 of In Memoriam, the face of nature has looked different. In common with the tradition in which he stood, Hallett's felt that a regressus infinitus was inconceivable, that therefore, quote, creation out of nothing is to be known from the light of nature, end quote. Where, for some reason, he omits the usual Isaiah 40, 26. Another problem which Hallett's takes up in the same connection is interesting, because it had been treated extensively by the medieval doctors, the eternity of the world, an eternal question to Christian Aristotelians. Two pages of close reasoning bring Hallett to the conclusion that, quote, 
the created world is in time not pre-existentially, but co-existentially, end quote. The same human reason which, unaided, could determine that there was a God who had created the world could also say, quote, He who could establish the heavens, the earth, and all that is in them out of nothing can also create again and reunite with their souls, the bodies of men, dead, and turned to ashes, end quote. Just in passing, he attacks Copernicanism by referring to the immeasurability of the movements of the heavenly bodies. Ever since Paul, Christian thinkers have closely linked the natural knowledge of God with the natural knowledge of the law. In post-apostolic times, the influence of Stoicism made for the expansion of this concept. But like St. Paul, most Christians use it to prove the universality of sin. Quote, sin is an aberration from the divine law, end quote. This was simple enough, and it had 1 John 3, 4 behind it. But how does sin come about? It happens because, quote, in choosing one object in preference to another, the will often does not follow the ultimate judgment of practical reason, but neglects it, especially if it is torn in the opposite direction by emotions, end quote. Again, quote, the natural law commands those things which are in themselves honest and forbids those things which are in themselves immoral. Those things which are in themselves immoral are unbefitting of a rational creature, end quote. Among the, quote, things which are in themselves honest, end quote, and commanded by the natural law are, quote, certain things concerning the worship of God and the love of the neighbor. The manner of this worship, however, cannot be known in this state of sin, end quote. Hallett's separate discussion of the natural law is conventional but brief. One statement bears quoting, the natural law, quote, cannot be changed by God himself, for God can do nothing against his own justice, of which the law of nature is an express and infallible image, end quote. What, then, is the relation between the revealed law and the natural law? In addition to the usual discussion of the relation between law and gospel, there is an interesting passage which claims that, quote, from the beginning of the world to the flood, then from Noah to Moses, God declared the natural law to the patriarchs. The law of Sinai is a sort of epitome of the natural law, end quote. Hallett stands at the close of the classical period of orthodox Lutheran dogmatics. His approach to these two problems, the clarity of the biblical revelation and the capacity of human reason, is all the more significant for that reason. For despite variations and occasional extravagances, the theologians of that period held fast to the clarity of the biblical revelation because it was the revelation of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and maintained that men's reason has a certain capacity because thereby, quote, they are without excuse, end quote. Man is a sinner because he is capable of knowing God and still rejects him. But during Hallett's lifetime, forces were being set in motion, which eventually beclouded that insight. Opposing the tendency of classical orthodoxy to identify the believing man with the thinking man, pietism came to identify the believing man with the feeling man. Inevitably, the rational criteria set up by orthodoxy became suspect, with the result that pietism posited the theory that the biblical revelation is clear in terms not of the intellect but of the emotions. Even more dissatisfied with orthodoxy, but unable to accept pietism as a substitute, early German rationalists rejected the primacy of the biblical revelation and ultimately proposed that natural religion replace it. In pietism and rationalism, then, the tension between revelation and reason was eliminated. As Hans Emil Weber has shown, rationalism could claim a certain continuity with orthodoxy through their common interest in natural theology. But it is equally clear, and here Albrecht Ritschel's Gestite des Pietismus needs considerable revision, that pietism too could claim a certain continuity with orthodoxy through their common emphasis upon the supremacy of revelation, despite their divergent views on the psychological agency through which that revelation is mediated. For an evaluation of that continuity, and of the stand of Lutheran orthodoxy on the eve of the controversial 18th century, David Friedrich Hollitz is indispensable and nowhere does his critical position in the entire development stand out more sharply than in his view of natural theology. Valparaiso, Indiana